as Peter Ronald at Sosa. And uh, this interview is part of the project Alice, Strange Mirrors, Unsuspected Lessons. Our guest today, as I said, is Professor Peter Ronald de Souza. Peter de Souza is currently the director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies. Prior to this, he was a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Development Societies, where he was co-director of the Law Committee program on comparative democracy. Professor de Souza taught political science at Goa University for 16 years and headed the department from 96 to 2001. Two. He, also, uh, he has been also uh, one of the three principal investigators of a five nation study published by Oxford University Press on the state of democracy in South Asia. We'll talk about that in a moment. He has been uh, visiting scholars in various universities such as Ber Birkbeck College, London University, the Taubman Center, Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, among many others, of course. His innovative work on democracy mainly links directly to the democratizing democracy axis developed with the, within the ongoing research project, project ALICE, coordinated by the Ventura Social Center. Thank you for being with us. It is an enormous pleasure to have with, uh, you with us. And I will start with a personal uh, question, and that is, in your personal trajectory, the decision after 75 the year of the emergency in India to move from a career in biochemistry, a promising career, and to a role in political science. Can you talk with us a little about this personal decision? Actually, uh, 75 was a, um, was, was, was a very dark period in Indian democracy. Uh, when I say it was dark, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it with hindsight. Because in 75, those of us who were students of science were witness to large movements that were taking place in India. Movements against corruption, strikes from various labor unions, the railway union being the most significant. There was a, there, there was, there was a vast uh, uh, sea of protest right across the country. And uh, we were trying to understand it because we were trying to understand uh, you see, you must remember the 70s was, was a period which, which the late 60s were in Europe and in, and, and, and in the United States. There was, it was a period of protest. Mm -hmm. It was a period of youth protest for peace, for a better world. It was a period of ideology. And, and you have to understand that the same you know, movements in song, movements in film, movements in, in, in relationships between the sexes, movements in... Um, uh, you know, solidarity with remote regions, Nicaragua, Palestine, were, was part of the culture of youth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seemed more exciting than biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but 70s was also a very important uh, phase in, 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 in the process of Indian democracy engaging with a constitutional order. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was the lowest point. As I said, now I'm speaking with hindsight. Yes. It was the lowest point in the judicial system uh, when the courts uh, suspended civil liberties, mm -hmm. when the highest members of the judiciary congratulated the political establishment. So it was, it was the nadir of Indian politics. And we, as the young, who were part of that culture I was talking about, uh, believed that we had to fight it. Now, I moved from chemistry to political science by accident. Uh, I didn't want to do chemistry and I didn't know where to go. And uh, I met young people who said, why don't you come to this new university that had been set up in Delhi, the Jawaharlal Nehru University, which believed it was a republic. You know, it, did, <laughs> it was a space of protest, it was left, it was, uh, it, it was challenging you know, all, the, all the established codes of uh, the modern state. And it was exciting to be young. So it was as, as it was, you know, in the immortal lines. It was bliss mm -hmm. to be young in, in, in that period, mm -hmm. and I, I was lucky to be there. That's when I moved to political science. Okay. So political science was an accident. So it could have been history, it could have been sociology, but it was not chemistry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that reflects in your your work uh, uh, due to your reflection of all constitutional order, democracy. Uh, I, I read your CV. Uh, it's not an accident. 
I think, yeah, I think uh, what the sciences, what the sciences did to me is they brought a certain, a certain method yes. of, of dealing with the empirical world, a method of, of engaging with, let's put it this way, and I think this is important and I'd like to sort of foreground this word, a method of dealing with inconvenient facts. Uh, and, and unless one recognizes facts to be inconvenient, uh, inconvenient for theory, inconvenient for frameworks of analysis, uh, one is not able to derive the true, the true lessons of those inconvenience. That's why I call them inconvenient, because you don't know where to place them. They don't fit into existing frameworks. Uh, but they are there, you see it. And, and science gives you the eyes to see it. Uh, at least it gave me the eyes to see it. So, so that has been my pursuit, to look for the inconvenient facts. So, so the theory begins to enter ambiguous spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you don't have the inconvenient fact, you don't get the ambiguity of theory. Mm -hmm. You get you know, templates, established templates. And I think our epistemology of the South project is to enter these ambiguous spaces mm -hmm. and see how we can make them uh, uh, less ambiguous, how we can reconstruct them in, in, uh, in imaginative ways so that they speak of the world that we are investigating and not impose on the world that we are investigating, which is what standard epistemologies of the North do. They, 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 they impose frameworks. We want to, we want to, uh, we want these frameworks to sit comfortably with these inconvenient facts. So, so they have to be redesigned. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I will go to some of your, your writings. And <laughs> uh, in your book chapter, Peace of Minorities and Multiculturalism, you say, and I quote, the protection of the life, liberty and property of the minority cannot be ensured through the exercise of strengthening minority rights per se, but can be ensured by the general protection of human rights. This is very actual in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and in our context. Can you elaborate, uh, Professor, on this and uh, the case of India, of course, but also how it applies to Europe or other contexts that you know? No, I think this is a very timely question, even though that article was written more than 20 years yes. ago. <laughs> uh, it's a very timely question. I mean, when I say timely, let's begin with Europe. I think Europe has come to recognize that its cultural other, uh, the minorities, the new minorities of Europe, are here permanently. And they need to understand how they must re-accommodate them within their own constitutional and institutional frameworks. Uh, these are minorities that, that perhaps are even challenging the fundamental premises of the legacy of uh, you know, the French Revolution, of the legacy of the, even the legacy of the, of the European Enlightenment. Uh, and some of these challenges are at the foundational level. So Europe has to revisit its own foundations to deal with you know, uh, uh, the, the, the new assertiveness of its minorities that are permanent minorities. They're here permanently, they're not going back. And I mean really the, the challenge of the Islamic world. Uh, now, man, many of these challenges are on terms of, on issues of rights. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and these claims are made uh, in terms of moral claims. Uh, so Europe has to has to revisit the moral debate. It's not, it's not a settled debate because the claims are substantive. The claims are made with, with, with analytical rigor, but they're different. They don't, they don't. Gender rights, minority rights, human rights look very differently from these perspectives. But in Europe, we have a European Court of Rights that have ruled in favor, they have been, uh, can I say, progressive, if the word can be used in this way. But there is the favor, as you know, uh, uh, giving all constituting uh, uh, constitution, review constitution, referendums, and uh, some uh, intellectuals, you and Habermas and I, have been reading about the constitution of Europe. But it's a fair, as you say in, in another your words, uh, the thick line in Europe is with the states, not with the union. And how do you see this? And comparing now with India, to a specific project that we did, you did. Uh, in India, I think in that sense, India offers itself as, as uh, a, 
a democratic space, a democratizing space uh, that is valuable for Europe. Because central to this democratizing space, and from which Europe can learn, uh, is the dealing with diversity. How do you, and when I, I, I use the word dealing very deliberately, because yes. dealing can be accommodation, dealing can be um, um, compromise, uh, dealing can be managing. So I mean, these are all subtle differences. They, 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 they are, they are family of, families of concepts, uh, but they have subtle differences. Uh, and, and India sometimes, as part of its dealing, it ignores. It doesn't always attend. It doesn't always respond. And ignoring is one strategy of dealing. Uh, as much as taking seriously is another strategy of dealing. Uh, now, in the last 65 years, a certain, there is a certain history of, uh, of how India has responded to its own minorities. And, 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 and these are minorities, not just religious minorities, they are linguistic minorities, cultural minorities. Some of them have constitutional status, some of them do not, but, but they are becoming assertive. In fact, as a colleague of mine put it rather succinctly, and I think that that's a nice way for, with which to enter the, dem, the minority debate, is India is a democracy of communities. Communities as collectives are beginning to assert their claims. And, and, and uh, all the communities are minorities in that sense. There, is, there are so many fissures and fractures in India that, that uh, you can't say that, that one group forms a majoritarian space. It claims to, it tries to, but it doesn't succeed. Uh, so in, there are 65 years of recent history to draw upon and learn from. And, and I think that's what uh, Europe can begin through dialogue uh, to understand. How has India dealt with its diversity, which is becoming increasingly assertive? Mm -hmm. One way of dealing with it is through, through changing the architecture of institutions. So we have federal processes which are quite innovative. Another way to deal with it is to give minority rights. And that is one of the questions I had dealt with in that article. Uh, a third way to deal with it is to, is to uh, um, provide state uh, support for, uh, for, for protecting say minority languages. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple strategies uh, and, and I think uh, it's very important today for large political formations like Europe, India, China, uh, Latin America mm -hmm. to seriously engage with the minority question mm -hmm. because uh, uh, it's, not, it's not the uh, charity of the state or the charity of the majority. It's, 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 it's the order of the modern world. We are all minorities. Mm -hmm. so, so. But, uh, and you, you touch there on an important uh, team in your writings in for the Alice project, and that means scale. How, epistemologically and methodologically, how do we deal uh, uh, with comparisons between small countries like Portugal? Italy and India, and also not just population and territory, but also cultural uh, diversity. Are our methods adjust to that? Have we been reflecting on that as much as should be? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked me that question because that's one of the hardest questions methodologically. Uh, when we do comparative studies, uh, we, we, we try and compare things which are, which look similar. Uh, and if, if the comparison is between entities that are at least proportionately similar, then we have a, we have a good robust comparison. Now the thing about India is scale changes the whole, the whole method. Uh, it changes it not because it, you know, it, it introduces a complexity into the comparison. This, so far, methodologically, I feel comfortable in saying, but now the problem gets more complex. When, it, when, it introduces, when, when you introduce scale into the comparison, you introduce the possibility of a different kind of trade-off. 
when, 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 when democracies uh, enter the future, they enter the future at different times making trade-offs, you know, uh, between a certain policy on education and uh, you know, uh, state commitment to it. I mean, that if you look at the package of policies, there are complex trade-offs between sectors, between between principles, uh, between um, um, populations, between you know, the future and the present, uh, the between different sections of the present. So, so all democracies do trade-offs because they have to they have to be in, they try to be inclusive. But when you introduce scale, the nature of the trade-off changes, and we you know that has to be mapped, and it hasn't been mapped to my understanding because sometimes what may seem like an undemocratic act may be necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I, this is very, this is dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and obviously when I'm saying it, I'm speaking as a democrat. You know? mm -hmm. But it's an inconvenient fact. Mm -hmm. Scale requires you know, new epistemologies. Mm -hmm. We need to understand what scale, that's a, I mean, the summary point is this, we need to understand what scale does to democratic trade-offs. It's not the same kind of trade-off that happens in smaller countries, where, where, the, where the scale is not an issue. So you can compare Sweden and Portugal, you can compare uh, Portugal and maybe Italy, but Portugal and India, Botswana and India, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're, how do you deal with, uh, I mean, so, I think part of the problem with scale is it produces a whole series of paradoxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking as I go along because it's such a complex question. Uh, you, you, for example, give you an example. I mean, this is a good example. At the moment in India, one of the one of the largest programs of welfare is being planned: the targeted cash transfers. And 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 if it works, uh, we will have attended to some of the persistent problems of Indian democracy, uh, you know, problems to do with access to food, problems to do with access to state services, because in, the traditional method of delivery was producing a lot of corruption. Now to do that, the state is using modern technology to produce uh, a unique identity for each resident in India. But that involves compromise on civil liberties. How do I make a choice? 1.2 billion people with a unique identity, which is maybe a compromise on civil liberties, but I'm giving them welfare. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of trade-offs which Europe will easily vote and say civil liberties, not, not welfare, because you know it's easier to although we do have all, uh, all have ID cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not a problem. But but, the, but in Europe you've had a debate on this. I think course. Germany has rejected yes. uh, a national identity card. England has rejected yeah, a national yeah. identity card. Australia's, I mean, not Europe, but Australia too. Yeah, so, yeah, civil liberties is a... But in India, I think it's an open question. Mm -hmm. and, and I think scale makes that sort of difficult. That's a complex trade-off. Yes, but you have said an uh, important thing, and that reflects also in your writings, that is uh, the importance of democracy in itself. That democracy is a political discourse uh, that constitutes, if you want it or not, uh, popular common sense and that it's different, you say it, new ways of organizing collective life, new processes for social interpretation and a vibrant public sphere. These concepts, if they are in the public sphere, they do the change, they uh, give resources for claims. Uh, uh, is that... Uh, I, I think you're, su you're summarizing my position better than I can. <laughs> That's <laughs> 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 because you were uh, much critic in uh, <coughs> writing in 2000, uh, very important, very keen, very direct, of people that analy analyzed Indian democracy, and you said it was ethnocentric, it was compliant to hegemonic dominant discourses, and carried an ideological baggage. For example, you're very critic of the creolization concept. Can we take cases from other contexts and really to analyze India or Europe or, or whatever it is. And that was what I was asking you. No, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that 
word that you picked up, and I think that's quite central, uh, democracy has become a common sense. I mean, I, I, I really like us again, the Alice Project, to, to investigate, to probe, what does becoming a common sense mean in, in the global south? <coughs> because uh, uh, it has entered the imagination of the subaltern. So whenever we are in situations of dispute increasingly, they say, let's, let's solve it through majority voting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so democracy has uh, become a part of our consciousness. And, and, and that is why we are witnessing at the, very, at the present moment in India, huge protest. Because as you rightly said, uh, people are, feel that they have the right to make claims. It is their right to demand. It is their right to make claims. And that is happening. Uh, I think we need to map this common sense. I think this word is very important. Again, under-theorized, under-researched. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm grateful that you, 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 you used it as a key word uh, you know, in, a, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you also uh, propose or write about and this is not political, but not uh, uh, to refresh and appropriate universes. Uh, and that is, uh, there are surprise voices, there are excluded, uh, there are absences, both in terms of sociology and mental health. Uh, but um, it is our duty as scholars and as activists to, uh, re to uh, think about these appropriate universes that can be inclusive. inclusive uh, and that can be the basis of institutions that uh, can uh, change. We need that universes. And you talk about size. Can you elaborate a little bit about this? Uh, of course, they are different. Uh, no, I, I, I think, again, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm finding a very interesting convergence in our conversation. Uh, but I think uh, some of the protest movements, some of the social movements in India contain the seeds of these alternative universals. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, very clearly in mind the Dalit movement, the movement of the suppressed groups in India, because they are challenging, uh, the, the, uh, they are just challenging the established order. And you can see this, the challenge has entered the classroom. I, I mentioned the classroom because that is where universals are debated. Yes. And, and, and today they are, you know, the notions of what constitutes dignity uh, is, being, is being challenged. So the whole, the whole notion of self-respect uh, is coming up. The whole, the whole notion of uh, uh, what is an emancipatory claim is coming up. The whole notion of, of reparation, historical reparation, uh, is coming up. So these lend themselves to engage, engagement with universals. Uh, what does one do to right a historical wrong? And to, the only way you can answer that is by reference to universals. But which universals? How much should you, how much concession should you make? So what we are witnessing in India is, for example, a rethinking of uh, many of the normative discourses of the hegemonic north. Uh, in, 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 I'll give you an example. I mean, mm -hmm. say on, on. when you talk of democracy uh, in the, the north, they want to analytically separate the concept from justice or from rights. Rights and justice are separate concepts. They're also important, but they're separate normative. They contain a separate normativity. In India, if you take, say, take away justice, from democracy, nobody will be interested in democracy. They want justice. They want social justice. So social justice is an element of democracy. It's not a separate concept. And, and, and how, to, how to deal with this is a, is a, is a, is a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. Because the philosophical tra tradition in the, in the North is to separate. Don't. Justice is justice and democracy is democracy. Rights is rights and democracy. Equality is equality and democracy is democracy. So democracy gets 
enfeebled. It becomes a kind of government forming idea. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, democracy carries a huge normative load. And you cannot you cannot surgically remove these other normative elements from it saying, no, 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 we must take them out. So these are the kind of mm -hmm. And this is a challenge for a project that uh, I, I see very in the smallest of the South to think about these universes. How do I work bottom up in co presence and uh, uh, are attentive to this universe. This, this is a this is the challenge. But this is also the exciting. This, yes. this is what makes it so exciting because if we can do it, if we can do it collectively with scholars from the global south who are, you know, who are dealing with the inconvenient fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, you know, when, when you have uh, movements of uh, uh, native peoples in different parts of the world, what are they saying about, about what constitutes the good life? Mm -hmm. uh, what you know? How do they how do they understand what is the public interest? These are huge questions. The public interest, the common good, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and this they are saying things differently. So so we have to seriously engage. But as you say, the bottom up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that the idea of the inconvenient fact is to act as a conceptual anchor. Look for these inconvenient facts all over the. And then see what it's doing to dominant discourses. Mm -hmm. Because if they, if the, if we get, if Project Alice can generate a vast amount of inconvenient facts, then the universal will begin to wobble. It will not, it will not be able to hold its, its comfort zone will, will be considerably undermined. Mm -hmm. And you say that uh, concepts have their own times, mm -hmm. and that it's important to. To bring to the public sphere the concepts that you want to engage and you want to challenge. But on the other hand, as you also write, <laughs> and we talk about this universe, about the role of political elites, and you, you wrote this when reflecting on Europe and India, a specific project, and you say that uh, political elites uh, further the politics of identity, and we see that ethnic counterpart debating an enemy within, we have been seeing. Oddly, in France, the resurgence of, of this discourse in a socialist government. This is a contradiction of the bureaucratic yes. uh, polity. Uh, and, and also, these political leaderships insulate themselves from criticisms. And uh, I was asking if could, how can, of course, we do our research projects, but uh, political elites are a little bit insulated. Uh, yeah. You know, in India, I mean, the political elites, see, this is one of the paradoxes that democracy is producing. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an important paradox. We need, to, uh, we need to explore this enough. We need to go beyond the conventional elite theory. Uh, democracy is producing a democracy of communities. So, so communities are getting voice, and that's good. That's, that's democratization, right? Democratizing of the polity. But more, the more communities get voice, a leadership emerges among them that begins to articulate that voice, represent that voice. These leaders begin to do two things. One is they get co-opted by the dominant system. And the second is they begin to, to consolidate their communities, they go into ethnic outfitting. So they, they get shrilled, they, they begin to argue against other communities, they construct the other as a, as a hostile other. And that's bad for the other communities. So you're, you're beginning to get a kind of adversarial politics emerging through the process of democratization. That's the paradox in a plural society. So uh, recently in, in the city of Mumbai, we had uh, one of the with one of the fairly articulate local political groups, uh, the Shiv Sena, mount a campaign against uh, immigrants to the city of Bombay. Now, Bombay is the most cosmopolitan space in India. And, and it became a very parochial space through such politics. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, people coming to earn their livelihood in the city of Mumbai faced physical insecurity. They were targeted, they were attacked. And the, I mean, the tragedy of uh, the, 
the way politics goes is that to appease this militant politics of the Shiv Sena, the state made compromises. To the extent at which when, when the leader of the Shiv Sena passed away, this, he, he got a state funeral. So, uh, so we, have to, we have to map the politics of elite co-option, elite, uh, elite manipulation. Co-option so that those of us interested in the emancipatory politics of the South must know how to guard against the co-option because the North is very powerful and the North will use the most subtle strategies to co-opt. And you won't even know you're being co-opted. You know, it's, it, they, they, they get you on culture, they get you on economy, they get you on politics, they get you on a whole range of, of seductions, you know, uh, material and cultural seductions. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then, then you know you're, you're dealing from your social base. Uh, I would like to change a little bit and, <laughs> and talk about uh, uh, Gandhi's inheritance. And we see it in Europe. Not as spread as it was before, but uh, some social social movements uh, adopting uh, the strategy of civil disobedience. That has become not it's not new, but with the what so-called crisis in Europe, we see many movements that uh, deal directly with Gandhi's uh, thought and uh, recommendations or practical actions. Could you elaborate a little bit? Is it possible to read this? Uh, Adoptions, or uh... I, I would actually offer the idea that Gandhi is one of the greatest allies uh, for an epistemology of the South. Uh, Gandhi is an ally, at least at four levels. He offers us alternative concepts: Swaraj, Ahimsa, Sarvodaya. Poor translation would be freedom non-violence and, and, and the benefit of all. But these are alternative concepts which any epistemology of the South must, must engage with. He offers us alternative texts. His, 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 I mean, he, his, he was not a systematic thinker, but he, he wrote extensively. But one of the books that he, uh, through, through the normal form of Hindu Swaraj, uh, is available as a critique of modernity, as a critique of the West. He offers us alternative institutions. Uh, again, this is so, you know, he's an ally of the epistemology itself, in the ashram as an institution. He has this classic, beautiful line which all of us engaged with the epistemology of the South must think about. He says, if you have learned to live by the rules of the ashram, you will be ready for public life. What does that mean? I mean? That means if you have learned to live according to certain moral codes, which life, which ashram life requires you to live, then you will have developed that moral persona, which can withstand the storms of public life. I think that's what it means. Mm -hmm. So he offers us alternative institutions. I mean, I'm giving you some. He offers us alternative policy, you know, his policy on basic education. I mean, Gandhi is one of the, and, and Gandhi is contemporary. You know, when I look at, when I come to Europe and I, and I see the, the economic crisis in Europe, and I read about the economic, whether it's in Italy or France or Portugal, and I see the, the fact that the international financial institutions have taken over uh, the, uh, the economic space, the mind space, not just the material space. It's the mind space. The mind space. Uh, then, I cannot think of a better ally than Gandhi. Not Gandhi. I mean, we have to, you know, if we have to fight the mind space, we have to fight the idea that Gandhi was utopian. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was not. Maybe, you know, the, the current dispensation is 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 unrealistic. I won't call it utopian. Mm -hmm. It's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you said that the mind space, but uh, capitalism works through institutions and uh, through suffering. Your ways that goes away, you are employed, and uh, in, in your writing uh, you uh, were reflecting on alternative global discourse for production and management of wealth. And 
you resort to Gandhi, Gandhi. and the notion uh, and and completely scorch to market fundamentalism in this concept of trusteeship. And can you elaborate a little bit? Because it's not very much known in uh, you know uh, in today, today global capital has put forward the idea of philanthro capitalism, saying that uh, you can make your money, but you must give it away. Bill Gates, <laughs> Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, the what is called the the one percent. Uh, you, can only, you should only retain 1%. Uh, and everybody says, you know, this is great. But the, the, the essential character of capitalism remains. You, 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 you accumulate as much as you can through all the strategies of competitive markets. And once you have accumulated it, you, the owner of that capital, will, uh, will give it away through your foundations or whatever. Gandhi challenges the idea of ownership. He says, it is not yours. You, I mean, it's almost Lockean in its, in its, in its concept. It is not yours. Uh, you only have a proportionate share of it, which, you, which is there for your own need, but the rest belongs to God. God as a, as a you know, as a, you can, substitute, uh, you, can, you can substitute it with the secular public interest or yes. the common good. It doesn't, you don't have to read it very theologically. Yes. Uh, and and uh, therefore, the challenge is for us as social scientists to design the institutions by which we will codify what is the proportionate share, by which we will develop, like econometrics has done. Econometrics has developed a whole theory of compensation, right? And, and, and the whole financial market works on this theory of compensation. I mean, why, why shouldn't we have a theory of... Uh, you know, proportionate share, where we have developed technical tools to identify that. Uh, and we then develop the institutions by which the share that belongs to God gets, accumul get, gets uh, collected and dispersed. Uh, this, this at the moment has been treated as in the realm of the unrealistic. But take any key concept of capitalism today. It's equally optimistic. I mean, what what is what does merit? What is what is where is how do you measure compensation? How do you measure due due uh, uh, benefit? This is just arbitrary. It's 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 done by. A, but you have uh, as you know a Marcheson and uh, Nobel Prize, and he's arguing about capabilities and uh, trying to convert democracy. Uh, as you said, with uh, justice and go beyond roles of it. And uh, do you think he's, uh, I'm not saying succeeding, but uh, is it operational? Yeah, I think Amartya Sen is also a great ally. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because of the concept of capabilities, mm -hmm. and, and, and capabilities from which the idea of human development. So if we treat the idea of human development as the alternative idea to the World Bank inspired idea of growth, yes. uh, then, uh, then uh, uh, we have the basis of critique of the growth paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, because Amartya Sen has said that uh, in this model is freedom. So it's free freedom is not a product. Yes. Freedom is a process. So it's, it's uh, you know, development as freedom, not uh, not freedom as the after development. Mm -hmm. It's an outcome. Also. Yeah. It's a, so 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 I think he's an ally. Mm -hmm. He's an ally. But uh, but going back to Gandhi, in his writings, he's very keen to separate itself from Marxists. That is, uh, property is uh, is is he deals directly with that. <laughs> he writes about that. And, uh, this is not in the line of Marxists. Can you? Uh, I think. I think you, you, you yourself gave us a clue a little earlier. I think for Gandhi, non-violence is central. Yes. And, and for Marx, violence was, was the means of bringing about the new order. Mm -hmm. Gandhi would treat, I mean, for him, the entire structure of, of, of capitalist order was congealed violence. Mm -hmm. and, and that congealed violence had to be met through, through uh, an alternative culture of non-violence. Mm -hmm. In fact, not just an alternative culture, but an alternative culture in which you took the suffering onto yourself. Mm -hmm. 
and, and through that act, you would demonstrate the truth of, of your fair position. I mean, that, that's, that's a very complex idea, that by taking suffering onto yourself, the scales would fall from the other person's eyes. The other person would see the folly or the error or the falsehood of their own position. Now, will it happen? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's worth looking at. I mean, it has, uh, you know, some of the great uh, transformations in the world, whether it is Martin Luther King, whether it is Aung San Suu Kyi, whether it is uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Now, small movements, you're absolutely right. The Occupy Wall Street movement. It's, it's non-violence is central. The the uh, the, uh, the, the movements in Tahrir Square in, in Cairo, non-violence was central. Now even in Syria, this you know, the local people are. I mean, suddenly the idea of non-violence is an idea that is increasingly finding a global echo because people are innocent people are dying with the weapons of war that capitalism has created. I mean. But epistemology of the North has, has, has invisibilized these deaths. They are treated as, uh, in fact, it's a terrible word which, which the epistemology of the North has never interrogated. Uh, they call it collateral damage. That's a terrible word, collateral damage. That means it's a just cause that some innocent people will die. Before. And that has drift some military uh, to convert it to the absolutely. economic. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so the military vocabulary has now entered our public space. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I find, I mean, that word upsets me. How can, how can the lives of women and children be collateral damage? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no theory of, of ethics in the, Western, in the Western canon can justify that. But, it's not interrogated. Mm -hmm. uh, last question, it's about uh, the project has in its axis, so we have been talking about it, the other economies, and uh, uh, is it possible to think about human rights, transformation or constitutionalism, without thinking about other economies? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this? Uh, the alternative, to, or as post-capitalism, uh, we have been talking about that, is it possible uh, we have to think about in, in our academic contests and activist contests about, but is something emerging that you see that uh, can be a way? You know, I, I think the, the, the way to, to respond to a difficult question is first of all to recognize that there are sector specific and, and, and issue specific uh, responses. We, we are witnessing challenges on you know, how to deal with each of the crises that a modern contemporary society confronts, whether it's in education, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in water and sanitation, whether it is in urban spaces, whether it is in, in um, resource use, whether it's in energy use, whether it is in, in, in um, animal rights, challenges are occurring. Whether these will add up to a large picture, I don't know. Uh, I, I know it is important for us to first of all document and record these sector-specific, issue-specific, thematic-specific challenges. That's very important. We need our counter-discourse needs to be thick, full of detailed stories. And I, 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 I see from the Alice project that beginning in that direction is taking place. Lots of thick stories from all over the world. Stories of challenge, stories of innovation, stories of response. This is very important and I, I'm, really, I'm really hoping that our project can do that. I also think it's necessary for us to think on the macro scale. Yes. The picture may be, the picture may be, may be uh, unclear, may be fuzzy, but unless we have that aspiration of the the big picture, uh, these particular stories will become, uh, you know, will dissipate. But they will just be seen as small challenges. But we must see them as small challenges that are producing the alternative picture. And therefore, I think our challenges as, as researchers, as social scientists, as humanities scholars, as philosophers, as contemporary intellectuals, as public intellectuals, 
is to aspire to create what you know, the, the World Social Forum's slogan, another world is possible. We must, we must work towards this, another world. I mean, we have no choice. There is, the time is not on our side. There is a crisis. I mean, I am really disturbed by the crisis in Europe. You know, uh, I, I, I don't even know how one could develop a policy response to it. So yeah, so I think that's where we are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we can <laughs> relax. <laughs> thank you.